That is, that's us, is it? <laughs> okay. Morning, everybody. A few more people keeping in. It's all right, come in. There's some seats down the front. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, just turn, make sure you turn your phones off because you buy me a drink if your phone goes off in my talk. Um, so morning everyone. I'm going to share today some um, thoughts and uh, kind of workflows that we have been on on a bit of a journey at Viri Group in moving towards what we've kind of termed data first web development. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we realised we had a few uh, gaps in our workflows and what we did to kind of shift around the mentality but also the workflows and you know how we made sure that we don't have those gaps anymore and I'm going to talk about some tools that you may use or you may not have come across before to help you do some uh, basic data tracking on your Joomla websites without a huge amount of developer know-how um, that would allow you to track some more metrics that you might not be tracking at the moment um, that helps you to kind of give more information to your customers. It can help you to prove that you were right when you said changing that button to pink was not a good idea because the number of clicks went from, you know, 50 a month to two. Um, but also to show that you're doing a good job. So, you know, comparing the old website with the new website and how you can use data to actually show that. And we're also going to briefly look at a couple of additional tools that you can use to take that to the next level and really start to use data for growing your business. If you have any questions, I know sometimes it's really not, um, some people aren't confident enough to stick their hand up at the end, so you can go to the link at the top that will be active throughout the slides and you can leave a question there. So at the end I'll get the list of Q&As up and we can look through those and then if you want to put your hand up as well, you can. Um, but if you can hold the questions to the end, that would help. So, so a bit about me. Hopefully, the, this is going to work now. It's one of the best made plans. Worked earlier. Ah, okay. Ooh. No, what have you done? Broken the world. I've broken the world. Oh, there we go. Mm, that's weird. Um, okay, so my name's Ruth. I'm the CEO at Viria Group. I co-own the company with Marco, who's at the back. Um, I'm also crazy cat lady, so those of you who follow me on social media will know I've just got two baby ginger kittens who are about this big. Uh, so much of my social media is about kittens and related activities at the moment. Um, and this really came out of this talk came out of a mantra that I kind of have been banging away in the office about for years and that is that if you're not measuring something then you don't actually really know it and a lot of this goes on um, in the web industry of people throwing around numbers but it's are they actually the right numbers that you're looking at so the reason I think it's important that we measure things is because it's beneficial to you to be able to know what's going on to be able to share that information with your customers um, putting data at the front of everything that you do means that you're having the right conversations at the right time and things don't suddenly come up at you having realised you've missed something out. Um, and also it allows you to pick up problems before they become a crisis. So what I'm going to talk about are some of the ways we've changed um, how we've embedded this kind of principle in our, in our culture. Um, I'm going to put these slides up after the presentation so if you want to check out links that I'm sharing and what have you, they, they will be available on SlideShare. And uh, yeah, let's get cracking. So I'm going to just talk you through a basic web project workflow. Some of this might be familiar to you. Um, so at the beginning we get the client brief or you might have a tender on the web. You read what somebody wants and then you ask questions, you clarify that you understand what they mean, hopefully anyway. Uh, and you put together a quote that says this is how I'm going to achieve what you want. Um, at the time we probably would have maybe a designer and a developer involved or just you if, you're, if it's just you in the business and we're just making sure that we really fully know what we're getting into at this stage. And then the next stage we go to the design process where the clients accepted the quote, we're cracking on with 
putting together what they actually design. So for us, this is usually bespoke off the bespoke design work, but you might be choosing a template or figuring out what thing it is that you want to actually implement for that customer or adjusting your templates to meet. Then when they approve the design process, we start to build the system. So this is where our designers and developers are kind of working hand in hand um, to make sure that what is developed is actually what we expected. And we have regular reviews with the customer to make sure that what's actually happening is what they were expecting. And then we go back and forth with the customer. Um, we push it up to a testing environment to make sure that they can actually check it on their hosting environment. And then at some point they'll say, yeah, we're finished, awesome, great, let's deploy to the website. Does that sound familiar, roughly? Um, and this kind of process worked for us for a long time. Um, but my role in the business is to kind of look at the operational side of things. And I started to notice that there were, point, there were a few projects where things had slipped through the cracks. And it either held up deployment, so we'd missed a, a, a deployment date, or it was causing a hell of a lot of project scope creep because something popped up late in the day that we didn't realize or we hadn't asked the right questions and that therefore we don't make a profit on the project or we make less profit on the project. So it was having a real impact on our business and it was more importantly having an impact on our customers if we weren't meeting their expectations or we had to push things back. So yeah, we, we get to this stage of like, oh, oops, who didn't put the event tracking on the button or oops, we didn't deploy, I don't know, some optimization that like we were talking about in an earlier talk. Um, so that's what we were trying to figure out is what can we actually do to stop that oops moment? And when I started looking at it, all of those oops moments, we hadn't really um, thought about data right at the start of the project. So, so our data people or our marketing people had not been involved right at the project at the start. So I asked the question of our team, what would, what would be the difference if we actually made that part of our culture? That before we even accept a project, we're thinking about data. Before we even start designing something, we know what the action, what the call to actions are for each page, what each resource is going to be, how interesting that is for the, for the customer and for the, um, for our clients, so how valuable is it to know whether someone's downloading this resource. So it allows us to test out our thoughts on user experience, it's allowed us to um, track what features are actually being interacted with, to show the customer improvement over time, and um, to tie up in some cases what people are doing on the website with what actually happens after that, so if they become an actual customer, and that helps us give direction on how you could improve that, how you could improve getting people from a visitor to being a customer. So the fundamental thing is asking the right questions and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that in that stage where you're quoting or you're tendering or you're having a conversation that you're really, really clear about what their expectations are and that all of your questions are answered. So what I've put together is a few questions that we ask to kind of prompt the customer. Because a bit like in the keynote this morning, sometimes our clients literally are idiots. They're very good at what they do, but they have no clue about what happens on the website. They just get a form that comes to them and that's a customer, or they get a purchase and they have to ship a product. So sometimes you have to really kind of like, uh, almost like spoon feed them to get, to get the answers that you need. So it gives you clarity on your project brief. So it means that you're actually quoting for what you're gonna be doing. And it means that you can also be very clear that there are bits that they've missed out telling you. You can understand their objectives, so what, what is actually a success factor for them. Because it might not be what you think it is. So what they think is useful, it could be quite different. Those conversations can inform your design and development. So it's mu our designers are much more... Um, involved and engaged if I can say to them these are the things that the customer wants to happen on each section of the page like these are the things that you need to focus on because that's our expected outcome rather than we need a page that tells someone about the product because then they have to think about that process of well how am I going to what are they going to do what's the action whereas we can be very clear and it's also an opportunity to upsell other services that you might have 
So if they don't have a customer relationship manager, you could potentially offer to implement that and integrate it with their website. If they don't have a marketing system, an email system, um, leads tracking and nurturing system, you could ha offer to deploy that alongside the website. And if you don't do it, you can partner up with someone else who does do it. So it can also help you gr grow your business. So these are some of the questions. The first thing is finding out what is important to the customer. What is your primary goal for this website? So ultimately, what do they want to get out of the website? And what do you most want from the site? So they may want to get more customers, but actually they need inquiries so that they can then convert them into customers, or they need people to download their product brochure. So that might be like a micro want, and the macro, the big want, is more customers. So having those kind of conversations at this stage is really helpful. And how do you think we can measure success? Because you can put this into your quote to say this is what we're looking to do, this is what success would be if we do a good job here. You can measure it, so you can say if that's success for you, how are we actually going to prove that we are doing that? And it's something that you can track over time. So they could use it as a monthly metric in their board meetings to say our website that we've just spent 30k on has generated 60k of revenue, it's paid for itself in the first month. So having those conversations really helps with that. This one's a classic because we've had so we've had it several times where um, people have uh, not told us about third-party systems that they're using. So do you have a current website? If they do, hop on there and literally analyze the, it to death. So run Screaming Frog on it to get a list of all of the pages and resources. Look at all of the analytics that they're using. Click on some buttons and see if there's actually any events that are firing. So you get a really good idea of what they've got now, what the shortcomings are, and then what you can improve on. What works and doesn't work, the caveat for this is it can often lead to an hour-long complaining phone call about their previous developer. So yeah, just ask this one carefully when you... <laughs> Uh, but you want to know what actually works really well, like, and why does that work very well? Do they know why that works well? Uh, what doesn't work? What have they tried to fix it? Um, and what do they think might improve those things that don't work well? And do you use any third-party tracking systems? And the reason I add this is because one of our customers, we went all the way through, the, they're a really big news agency, went all the way through the process, the marketing guy had been invited to every single meeting, didn't turn up for every single meeting, turned up for the post-deploy meeting and then said, oh, well, I need Omniture tracking for Adobe Analytics. And we'd been kind of working on the assumption that they were using at, at, um, Google Analytics because nobody had told us any difference. So asking this question right at the start, at the brief stage, would have saved us probably about eight hours of development time, sucking out all the relevant variables to go into that tracking script. Um, and you might not get that from the person you're talking to. You might have to speak to a marketing person or a developer or a systems administrator, um, but do have that conversation. And if you can, get access to it so you can see the information yourself rather than see what they've been told by their marketers. So there is a difference between what's happening and what your marketing team tell you. Um, so the next question we ask is, well, how do you think we could integrate data into your business workflows, your business processes? What information from your website is relevant in your sales process? So for some customers, they might want to know every single page that a person has visited. So they fill in an inquiry form and they can go and look at the lead profile and see exactly what page they visited. For someone else, it might be how many people have come in through organic search? Are my ad words working? Um, is this form on my website being filled in by people who don't bother completing it because it's too long? So having that kind of uh, discussion about how you can inform their sales process is really uh, good because it also means you can think about that when you're developing the site. Can you talk me through the process from inquiry to conversion? And sometimes they may not know this. So sometimes you might have to put some kind of tracking on their site using Hotjar to actually watch the customer going through step by step by step or crazy egg or something like that. But it's really important that you also understand kind of like the time from inquiry to them actually becoming a customer. One of our customers, that can be anything like four months. So you want to know what they're doing in between that time on the website. How could we boost your sales process with data from the website? So it's kind of similar to the first one, 
but um, is there any way that we could help your stream sales process be more streamlined? So when you get an inquiry in, could we look at what the visitor has been doing on the website and what resources they've been downloading and therefore you send them to the most appropriate salesperson for what they are actually interested in? And we know that because they've been downloading assets and they've been accessing pages. That can save them an inordinate amount of time and give a much better uh, experience to their end customer because they're getting to talk to the person who's an expert in what they've been looking at. But when you, when you pick up the phone, they don't expect you to know that you know that. So you can be about much more proactive in the sales process. And baselines to me are really, really important. So can you share with me the tracking systems you're currently using? Sort of what we were talking about before, but it means that you can get a baseline and I would suggest that you document that in your quote. These are the number of visitors, these are the number of downloads, these are the number of what have you. So that you know at that point where they are. If they don't have it, um, also the inquiries and sales data, if they'll share it with you. Sometimes they won't share that with you until you're actually under a contract and then NDA, but that's useful as well to know. You can sometimes see it from your e-commerce analytics, but if they don't have any tracking set up, it's useful to get from their sales team. And then if either of those are missing, what we tend to suggest is, well, let's do a little mini project beforehand, implement these systems, and then whilst we're developing your new site, we can be looking at what's happening on your current site. And at least we have then like a month of data, so we've got a rough idea of what's been going on. It's better than nothing, shows that you're professional and you're thinking about this, and it also gives you another small project to do, which you might not invite, but it does give you a lot of um, useful information. So to cap up, we've talked about the importance of being, to recap even, the importance of being clear in your project brief so that you understand what it is that you're um, being asked to do, what data points could be relevant for the customer, <coughs> what their objectives and their priorities might be, and how we can bring all of that information into their existing workflows, into their data workflows. So this is all before we've actually, potentially before we've won the client, but also before we start doing any real work. So once we start doing the work, um, particularly when we go into the development process, using the right tools is really important. Um, one thing I would say is that tools don't create processes, they facilitate them. So don't expect to just get the latest amazing wonderful tool and that fix all of your completely chaotic processes in your workflow, it won't. But if you do have good processes in your workflows, they will help you work more effectively. So some of the workflow, some of the tools I'm going to mention, they may not work in your way of working right now, but if you need any help with kind of figuring out how they might, then grab me at lunch or during the day and I'm happy to sort of sit down and talk about how things might work with the way you work in your businesses. So it's important to consider tools because it makes things easy for your team. Some of the tools that we use mean that it doesn't always have to go back to the developer to be able to make a small change that a marketing person asks for. It facilitates professional workflow, so some of the tools allow you to actually implement changes and be able to roll back, to be able to test things in a development area before you push it up to the live site. Um, if you don't measure, you don't know. So again, this is what I started off with. If we're not actually measuring using the right tools, then we're not able to access the data and pass that information on to the customer. And the business intelligence angle is really important. Today, nowadays, things online are getting much more competitive. So the more information you're able to give your clients, the more they're likely they are able to grow their business. And you can obviously use this for your own website as well, for the same reasons. So is anyone here using Google Tag Manager? Couple of people, okay. So if you're interested in improving your data um, use within your website projects, I would really recommend that you start getting familiar with Google Tag Manager. It's an extremely powerful tool for developers and for marketers, and it has a lot of uh, cool things that allow you to pick up data tracking, throw it into analytics without knowing kind of like how it's doing it. It's kind of a bit like a magic black box that you set up cool things and it just does it. 
I've got a bunch of articles that give you information about how to actually get started with them, so don't feel like you have to take everything in today. Some of them I will show as links on the screen and I will share these later so you can come back and find them. So Google Tag Manager lets you set up environments. It allows you to test all your kind of marketing, event tracking, everything, MailChimp, everything in a development area, a demo area, staging area, testing, whatever. Whatever your workflow is, you can set up a separate version of the container to test in those environments. And then when you're happy that all the tags are firing when they're supposed to, you publish that container up to your live site. So you're not tinkering about with stuff on your live site that could break your JavaScript. You're testing it somewhere and then you're deploying here. It's version controlled completely. So if you, put, if you make a change to a tag that's in there and you balls it up and you deploy it and it doesn't work, you can just roll that back to the previous version and you're back where you started. You can make the change and then you can do it again. You can also see who has made changes to certain tags. So you could delegate your clients access at maybe a lower level so they can't publish but they can add. Um, and if they add something that doesn't work or that causes a problem, you know who to go back to or you know who has put the you know, thing in there that wasn't quite right. And you can have multiple workspaces. So I can be working on some changes to some tracking script, and the client can be working for some changes on the tracking script. We can both merge our changes into one and then push that up to our development area for testing. So it's not like one person editing the file. You can have multiple people working on your uh, data tags. And it's also simple to implement, and I think this is a really key point. There are plugins in the extensions directory where you literally just whack the container code into your site and you're good to go. So at an absolute basic level you can do that and they're free plugins so it's easy to work with. There's a film work up here about how to create the environments in Google Tag Manager, so how to create a, a version of a container for um, development, demo and live. Um, like any Google environment or any Google product, it's very, very easy to get set up. It takes you through a wizard to like put in the name of the website and then a couple of other things and hit go and you're there, basically. This is a slightly more um, a, a different workflow. So here you can see this is, I'm in a Google Tag Container, Tag Manager container. So you just go to google.com slash tag manager to, to get there. And when I click on admin here, you, this is very similar to kind of like analytics and things, the similar kind of layout. And down here is the environments um, setting. And that when you click on environments, there's a big red button that says new. And you just type in the name of your environment. So in our case, that might be dev or demo, but it can be whatever you like. A description so that might be relevant if you've got one for a particular type of testing or a particular stage in your workflow you can turn on debugging by default so for your dev areas you may well want to do that and then in here you just put the uh, final URL the URL of that environment and that allows you to generate some preview links and things that you can send to people to look at your tags and you just repeat that for every environment um, but when you're doing that, you also want to be able to test your analytics so that you're not polluting your basic live analytics <coughs> profile with all of your test environment stuff where you're mucking about with things. Um, people get a bit confused when they see hello world appearing in their event trigger and things like that. So I've also done an article on how you can set up different properties for your development demo and um, live environments in Google Analytics. That's the same kind of process. You, but it's documented there, so it's easy for you to, to look at. And then finally, how we implement that in Joomla, because we had a few problems in our bumps in our workflow where I was putting the wrong code into the wrong environment and things like that, forgetting to change it when we went live. So one of our developers actually wrote a little um, include script that we just put the relevant container snippets into one file, and then it's loaded automatically in our templates. So that's documented here, and there's also a link to a GitHub repo that you can just clone down and um, pop your Tag Manager code in there. <coughs> and the reason I say about using um, Tag Manager is because it lets a non-tacky person have a way of doing things like tracking how many people are clicking on a button. 
by using the markup that's on the page already. Okay? And the reason that I talk about um, data first is because you need to actually think about this before you deploy your website or as you deploy your website. You need to use appropriate class names in your code. So you know when we create a button in Joomla and if you're using Bootstrap, the class is like BTN, BTN large or something like that. Um, if you wanted to track the clicks on a particular button, you would also need to have home page inquiry as an additional class on the button or on anything that you want to track the links on. So it's important when you start off your process that your developers know that anything that we've talked about of being of interest when people click, it needs to have its own semantic naming <coughs> so that I don't have button one, button two, button three because that doesn't mean anything to me and it certainly doesn't mean anything to the client. But home page inquiry or pink button on contact form or whatever means something. So it needs to be distinct to your project and it needs to be semantically named based on maybe where it is and what it's doing. You guys can decide on that have a company kind of policy of what you do with your naming conventions. And the reason it matters is, so this is my, I have to use this pointer, sorry. This is my um, class. So I just um, changed the code on one of our homepage buttons actually. My CTA button class, so CTA being call to action. I just added another button class there. And this is within Google Tag Manager. And what I can do is to say, I want to tell Google Analytics every time someone clicks on this button, because I might have people clicking on it and they don't fill in the form. So if they fill in the form, I get a conversion, but I don't know who's actually clicked on the button. I don't know how many people are clicking. So that's why I might be interested in this data point. In Google Tag Manager, you can actually set up a trigger that will listen for clicks on a CSS class. How cool is that? So you use CSS classes all over your website, probably. If you don't understand what that means, your developers will do. So what this is doing is I'm, I'm saying, listen to, let's trigger this on some clicks, so not every click, but only when the click class contains this, or you can use matches, or you can use a regular expression, you can use all kinds of different ways. So this trigger that I've just created will fire whenever a link with my CTA button class is clicked on anywhere in my website. And that gets kind of cool when you start doing this. So you go into Tag Manager and you say, I want to fire an analytics event. So this drop down will change to event and I'll call it inquiry because this is my home page inquiry button. I'll call it the action as a click and the label is my CTA button, just so that it's easy for me to see. You can add a value if there's a value for that and then you add your tracking ID. I use a slightly funky way of doing this so that it automatically looks up the analytics for the right environment. And down here is where I say, this is the trigger for firing that event. Yeah, so I've set up an event and then I set up a trigger that will trigger when that um, happens on my website. But if I don't have those classes on my website, I can't track those clicks or those video plays or those so on and so forth. And what that looks like in analytics to your client, so this was my setting, is the inquiry is the category, the type of event that has been fired in analytics. And you can see that in a report. It tells you how many inquiries have been received, have been clicked, yeah? How many times that's been fired. And then when you drill into that in a bit more depth, you can see the actual location, like what page that was triggered from. So you might have the same button across loads of different sites using the same class, and that report would tell you which pages are being clicked on the most often, which can be useful. Um, you can also uh, click into it and say, how many times has this particular button been clicked over time? So it's very, very useful, and that's all done without any, the only code I needed to do on my website was to add in that class name. And if we do that right from the start, we're, we're away. But the next thing you need to do, why does that keep disappearing? That's annoying. Um, <laughs> next thing you need to do if you are working with this kind of thing and you're telling your customers we're going to give you this business information is to actually test stuff um, to make sure that it works. 
Google Tag Manager has a preview mode. So if, you, if you're logged into Tag Manager, you can turn on a preview mode and it will literally show you, you refresh your page and a little pane appears at the bottom and it will show you all the events and when they fire and what information is being fired. And then these are some of the other tools that you can get. There's a Chrome extension called Google Debugger, which will tell you all the information that is being sent up to Google Analytics. And you can look at that in your console in developer tools. So that's useful for seeing what's actually going on at the moment before you're actually working on the site, see what information is being passed. And you can, you can look at what other people's sites are doing as well with this. It's not just limited to you. Um, so if you think someone's doing cool analytics stuff, you can go and see exactly what they're doing. Wasp Inspector is my favorite one because you can, ta you can look at all marketing tags and you can see what information is being passed and where it's going and how it's interacting with other tags. And I'll show you a screenshot of that in a minute. Um, GTM Sona is another one which is written by Simo Ahava, who's like the god of Tag Manager. Where this one comes in useful is if you're filling in a form and then you're passing some information over to analytics, you can add, how many people have done it where you've had to like repeatedly fill in the form to check the submit feature is working and doing what it's what this does is it, when you hit submit, when you turn it on, when you hit submit, passes it out to a variable in Google console, in, you know, in F12 console. So you can actually look at the variable, the information that's being passed without having to send yourself an email a hundred times whilst you're testing a button. So that's a very, it's quite a niche thing, but that's really, really handy to use. And there's another plugin called Data Slayer, which I tend to use more for data layer stuff. Um, but that's again, again another useful one for testing where the data is going and what it's doing. So this is the Tag Manager preview. So you can see here, this is where the page has been requested. Oh, whoops, let's go back. This is where the page has been requested. We've got some scroll tracking scripts. So these are scripts that are automatic, that are written by someone else that you can just load up into Google Tag Manager and they're free. It's a company called Luna Metrics and they have a whole load of um, things like scroll tracking, external link clicking, how far your video is playing, how long people are engaging with your website, and so on and so forth. And you can just download them and upload them into Tag Manager for free. So that's what those um, scroll tracking ones are. Interestingly, for developers, this is telling you when the DOM is ready. So it's telling you what tags are happening before and after the DOM is ready. The window is loaded, and then we've got a whole load of other scroll tracking where someone's scrolling down the page. So this is firing an event into Google saying, they're at 25%, they're at 30%, they're at 50%, they're at 75%. Hey, they scrolled the whole way down. And all of that's happening automatically as an event in, tag, in Google Analytics. An engagement timer here, and then at the top here is where someone clicked on something. So we've got a, a click class being fired. And interestingly, also it tells you here which tags were not fired. So if you're debugging and you can't figure out what's happening, it might be that one of your tags is not firing. And then you can look at, well, why is that not firing? Have I got my triggers wrong? Am I on the wrong URL? Have I switched to HTTPS and I haven't updated something? So it's quite useful. And you can also sh send a link to someone who can preview your site and see this debug information. So you can send them a link, which is a, a preview, that lets them test tags that you might have done without them actually going live on your website. This is the uh, WASP inspector for Chrome. So you can see here, these are the tags in, or in yellowy orange that are on the site, and these are the scripts that are running. And this is just on someone else's site. So I can fire this up and inspect your site and see what you're up to. Um, and when you click on these, it gives you more information, which you can see here about exactly what information is being passed to the scripts. So it's really, really neat. But you can lose hours of geeking out with this kind of thing. So I do warn you, like, you really can. <laughs> but it's very handy if you're debugging stuff like e-commerce analytics. If it's not sending the right values, you can find out which, exactly which bit is not getting the right value and where it's coming from. So it's very, very handy for looking at kind of how you're managing data within your website. So all of the stuff that I've talked about is documented in, in the links I've shared, and we've covered how to use Tag Manager, basic level. Um, if any of you are around on September the 15th, 
There is Brighton SEO, which is an event down in Brighton at the Brighton Centre. Uh, no, Brighton Dome, I think it is. Um, and they actually have a training course on Google Tag Manager and Analytics. And it's the, by hands, you've done this, haven't you, Eddie? Hands down, the best value for money I have ever spent on a course. And it was amazing, the amount of information I came away with. So if you want to know more about Tag Manager, I really recommend that. Um, and we've also talked really briefly about how you can use the markup on your page to be able to then fire events into analytics and tell your customers exactly what's happening on different elements of the website. And a, a brief look at how to debug tags. So I'm going to have a little sneak peek of um, some of the more kind of advanced ways that you can use tracking and data to generate business intelligence for your clients. And I'm going to actually use one of our customers who has given me permission to talk about them. Um, oh, it's annoying. So about how we associate the data of what's happening on their website with actual real person and leads and what happens in their sales process. So, so the client is Firetrace Limited. They're a pretty much the worldwide best known supplier of automatic fire suppression systems. So if you have a fire on your cooker and you have their system in, installed or a fire in your VW camper or whatever in the engine bay, um, a, a tube will burst and it will automatically extinguish the fire before it even becomes a fire. So they're very well known. But their baseline, the only traffic they had was what was in Google Analytics and it was literally just shove analytics on the page and never look at it again, which I expect many of you will know that kind of situation. Um, so they were kind of looking at it and looking at referrals and saying, oh, we've got loads of referrals. Yeah, 90% of that is spam traffic because then, you know, they're not excluding bots, so on and so forth. They had absolutely no download tracking whatsoever. They had nothing. Very few leads coming in through the website at all. They had a contact form, product registration form, and a returns form. That was all they had on the website. So they had lots of leads, but it was, but it was working on their reputation. And there wasn't any kind of like proactive outreach from, from the company. They had no download tracking, and they had 73 downloadable assets, and no clue of whether anyone actually looked at them, how many people downloaded them, whether that changes over time, nothing. And three forms, as I mentioned. So, you know, they were kind of like ticking over, but they wanted to take things to the next level. And their goals were to generate an inbound sales funnel for those salespeople, for the relevant salespeople. So rather than just sitting waiting for someone to phone you, they were wanting to outreach to people who were interested in what they offer. They wanted to prioritise leads so that they know which ones are actually interested and engaged. They wanted to know who downloads which resources, what proportion of those actually become customers. Um, and also they wanted to know, like, how can we tell them if there's a problem? Like if we've updated a safety sheet, they need to tell people quickly, engineers and what have you, that something's been updated, or they've updated some commissioning instructions. They had no kind of easy way of doing that. So with this customer, they're also kind of not, I wouldn't say Luddites, but they're very slow adopters, and they're very hesitant about new technology. So we literally had to take baby, baby steps over two years so far. So the first thing that we did was to implement the Mortic in their website. So Mortic is a marketing automation platform that's open source and free. You can just install it on your website, <coughs> on it like a subdomain or a, um, in a folder. Nearly two years ago, we knew that these questions were coming up, so we just stuck Mortic in a subdirectory and we started putting the tracking pixel on the website and didn't do anything else. So while it's there, it's generating, it, it's tracking what people are doing on the website. It's looking at what level, what they're inquiring, uh, what they're accessing, and what links they're clicking on. And then about a year ago, they wanted to improve some of their inquiry forms. So we said, OK, that's fine. Let's just replace those with more tick forms. Does the same thing, sends you an email. It you know, does everything that your current system does. But it will, be tr it will be joining up the behavior of the person on the site with their inquiry and their lead profile. So you, when they send in the contact form, you can then go and look at what they've been looking at on the website. <clears throat> just recently, we, did, we won the contract for a new design and build. So the new website is what you'll see on there now. And at that point, we transferred all these 73 assets up to Mortic. So they can all be tracked. And we can associate that to a user's profile. And when we built the new website, it, was, it had Mortic fully built in. 
So we tracked all the downloads, we tracked all the form submissions, we tracked all the actions on the website, um, and that allowed them to see a lot more about what people were interested in. <coughs> so here you can see all of the assets, and then on oh, this pointer, um, we've got the download counts here. And when you go into an asset, you can see, oh, you can see over time the, a graph of how people are um, engaging with that asset. And for Joomla, it's really simple. So once you set up the form, you just embed it into your website with one shortcode, wherever it needs to go, in a module, in an article on uh, custom content. You install the plugin. You can get Mortic hosted for free for like 2,000 leads on mortic.com, or you can set it up yourself. And you just copy the link of where you've got it set up. So it might be mysite.com slash m. You just copy that, and then you use this shortcode where this ID number is the ID of the form. So each form, like a Joomla article, each form has an ID number. You just drop the number, and that will then render the form. You can also, if you're trying to be a bit more um, optimized, you could just copy the HTML, so you're not having a JavaScript coming in to render the form. Uh, and you can embed the JavaScript code, but you'd have to turn your editor off to do that in content. <laughs> so this is what it looks like. So this is actually a Mortic form here. Um, within the content. So first name, last name, email, phone. They wanted phone because a lot of their sales is conversation based and the company name because they want to know what companies are inquiring. They click download manual and it downloads immediately and then the form results get sent off to um, the office and we can do a co loads of other stuff. So this is the uh, submissions of the form that I was telling you about. So over the month they can actually look at all of their forms. So each of their 73 downloads now has a form in front of it so that people can, well no, some of them don't, but pretty much all of them. So they can see where the interest is changing over time. And they can also use that information to create a segment within the system. So they have a group, a way of contacting a group of people that they know have done a certain behavior on their website. So they know that that person has downloaded that resource or these people are from the United Kingdom, or these people are from Dubai, for example. And that means that we can contact them in a multiple of different channels. So they can just pick up the phone and call them, but also say we have an important update to a particular product. When that person comes back to the website, we can pop up a message to say, hi Dave, you downloaded this resource, there's an update, here's the link to get it. We could send them a text message, so a lot of their engineers are out in the field, don't always look at their emails. If it's urgent, you can automate that process to say, anyone who's accessed this resource or been to this page that we know their contact details, send them a message to update them and let them know. And you can do the old fashioned, send them an email to tell them that there's a new version. So it allows you to kind of like go from uh, behavior based on the website to active engagement with a real person with just by tracking the data more effectively. And the results that we've seen from this have been the leads have directed to the right salesperson because we know what resources they've actually been accessing. So we can see if they've downloaded all the vehicle installation manuals, that they're probably looking at installing it in a car or vehicle. So we'll send that inquiry to the vehicle person. So someone triages it and says, OK, they need to go to this person in HubSpot, actually. Um, it has bi-directional integration with a lot of CRMs. And then the browsing history, we can actually score certain pages that are more valuable to the business and say give them 50 points if they land on a page about commissioning because they're probably a procurement person who's going to be commissioning a large volume. So we really want that inquiry to be gone straight to someone who's dealing with that. Um, whereas if they're just accessing content they haven't ever downloaded anything, they're maybe not as valuable to us. Um, the monthly reports have been really fundamental because it, they've gone from not having a clue who's accessing the resources or you know, anything to being able to take the information to their board and say, well, this is what's actually happening on the website. In fact, one of their directors said, I don't think we need a website. People just phone us. You know, and now we're, now we're able to say, you really do need a website because this is where people are getting their information from. And it's given them an easy channel to be able to communicate about updates. And this has been really important because people don't tend to read the kind of like generic emails that go out from MailChimp or whatever that say, we've updated these manuals in the last month. 
But if you send a targeted message to that person when they're on the website, or you send a targeted text message to them, obviously with consent that you would be able to do that, your, your engagement rate is much higher with the customers, and they're getting the information that's relevant and tailored to them. And it all starts with those conversations right at the beginning. Wouldn't you like to be able to track your downloads? Wouldn't it be helpful to be able to communicate to people who've used your resources? So for this customer, it was definitely a success having those conversations really early, thinking about it in the design so that there's a call to action wherever they are on the website, making sure that it was really easy for them to fill that form in so we don't get people who can't be bothered. So we just asked for a minimal data set. And in the future, there are other things we want to implement. So actually having stages so you can track whether they're an inquiry or a, a, an actual customer. Um, being able to text message people as we update things. Um, and also that you can use a feature called dynamic web content. So you know what they're doing on your website because you're tracking the events and you're tracking all the information. Why not change what you actually show to the person on the website based on their behavior? So if they're a really engaged person, you might want to give them a voucher for 20% off your extensions. You know, if there's someone who tweets with you all the time, you might have a We Love Our Tweeters month where you, anyone who's a, mentioned you on Twitter automatically sees on your website that there's a special offer just for them because they've mentioned you on Twitter. So the more you can use data in the systems that we have, the more likely you are to be able to kind of leverage technology and engage with people personally and let's face it, all of us probably prefer to be engaged with personally than to be shouted at with a megaphone about what a business is doing. I'd much prefer it if people target things directly to me. Um, so I hope that's been helpful. Um, I know I've covered quite a lot of things and there's some things that I've just kind of gone into in really small detail. So are there any questions at the moment that I can answer? I'll just have a quick look on none on the... So I know you're saying about uh, targeting you know, individuals yeah. you know, based on their action through your site yeah. and so welcome back you downloaded something. Yeah. Is that through the multi or through um, the general analytics? Sort of, how would that actually work? So the question is how do you target the individual person based on their yeah. behaviour and what they've done? Yeah. Um, it's tricky to do that with any system that doesn't track them down to the individual. Yeah. Uh, we do that in Mortic, but Mortic is fully embedded into the website. So it's not like they, for the customer, they don't know any different. But okay, okay. from our so perspective, we see yeah. that information in Mortic and yeah, yeah the information the profile. Yeah, but the integration with HubSpot means when I go into a CRM, every customer in the CRM has a um, profile link to Mortic. Mm -hmm. So I can, if I'm working on a deal and Alex has inquired about a deal and he's inquired through my website, then I can click on the link in HubSpot, go to his lead profile and see what he's been looking at on my website. The caveat with that is you do need to make sure your privacy policy makes it clear that you can identify people down to the IP effectively. Um, you can have us visit the privacy policy on our website because we got it, yeah. I'll just follow up on that a little bit. Yeah. For those who don't know anything about the general data protection regulation which yeah. comes in next year, there's going to be massive things about uh, tracking awesome. yeah. uh, and, and privacy policies are going to get, have to be updated yeah. dramatically. Yeah. Uh, it's not just privacy policies, it's how you work. It's when yeah. you do automatic tracking and monitoring and processing of data. Mm. Um, that whole issue about consent is, is yeah. a big thing. Yeah. And you can only use data, uh, when you collect data, you have to be very transparent about what data you're collecting yeah. and what you're doing with it. You yeah. can only use that data for the purpose of which it was collected. Yeah. So um, if you don't know about the GDPR by yeah. now, you should do. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's actually quite a big opportunity to talk to your clients about it as well. Yeah. To say that this is something that you need to be aware of if you're, if you're not familiar with it, actually get up to speed with it. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Because when you're asking, they will say we can put all this tracking stuff on there. Yeah. Um, there's, there's going to be massive issues because there's also going to be an e privacy, an update to the e privacy directive. You remember the old cookie? Yeah. Cookies. There's also going to be an update to that which comes in at the same time as the GDPR, which is 25th of May next year. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, 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 it's very that. true. And, it, and I think the other thing to make very clear is your data protection has to be on par. Like, you really must be an ICO data controller. You must take your data protection seriously. 
because yeah. you are capturing contact. It's one, well, it's one of the things that you, you will be also a controller of the yeah. data as well as the customer, even yeah. though it's sort of tech, their sort of data. Yeah. But the relationship between processors and controllers, without getting too technical about it, mm. and this whole thing, is um, processors are equally responsible now for yeah. GDPR because they weren't under the Data yeah. Protection Act in the UK data protection. Mm. If anybody's really interested in the GDPR geeks, I'm assuming I'm just yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine, that's fine, that's a good point. Are there any other questions? No? I was going to oh. ask if you. Yeah. Uh, you said at the start about tracking incompleted yeah. uh, forms or yes. failures of things. Yeah. That's something that we use. Uh, um, if you're interested in incomplete tracking of forms, do you mean like abandonment? Yeah, abandonment. Yeah, um, Hotjar is probably the one that I would recommend for that, which is has a free plan, so you can do that. The only side, downside, I don't think at the moment that they will actually track JavaScript generated forms. So that is the reason why you would use the HTML embed rather than a JavaScript to bring it in, because then you can track it with that kind of thing. But also, if you run an e-commerce store, you would also want to be reporting on abandoned carts, like for known p customers, but also for mm -hmm. guests. Because, and things like J2 Store, they have a plugin that allows you to report on that. And if you know of the customer, email them and say, hey, Bob, notice that you, have, you know, haven't completed, and you can monetize, you know, say, here's a 10% coupon for <coughs> being a loyal customer. Let's get you checked out, or whatever. So. <laughs> That kind of information again, you have the data available to you, like use it if it's appropriate to use it. So, yeah. I was going to say, if anybody's got any doubts about that, we, we do that on our own. We're a distributor as well as a web yeah. And we do that on our own store. Mm. Um, the ones that are incomplete, if I just drop them a line and say, I noticed you were here, great to have you, but you didn't. Yeah. 80% of those turn to say. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not even tracking it, then yeah. you don't even know about it, do you? And so a lot of the cart systems do actually have that. So, And the classic one for extensions is if someone's gone through the process of wanting to renew their subscription and then they haven't checked <coughs> out, you want to know about that. You want to be in touch with them and say, hey, I noticed you hadn't checked out. So, yeah. yeah, but they're usually logged in in order to start that process, aren't they? Especially for renewals of, of, of systems. So. Okay. I'm not sure how we, I think we're getting a bit tight. Is there any drop off of downloads once you put like a gateway form in there? Uh, no, but we do get some people putting in dummy data, yeah. which I do. If, I'm, if I don't want to give that person my data and I know that I'm going to get the download anyway, then I put dummy data in. It's more to figure out what is uh, annual intervention subsequently. Well, if you were to send an email to that email address after they have downloaded saying thanks for the download blah 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 and it bounced then it would do a hard bounce and clean it or the system that you use for sending the email so we use Amazon SES and that would automatically deal with that for you so but that that is possible when you put that kind of lead capture in but um, it's sort of like the benefit outweighs the any loss because if they want that for that document they want that document and they need it you know, and so most of the time they will put their details in and that those opportunities didn't exist before until they either bought the product through a supplier or what have you or called or so filled in the contact. They, if they complete the form, they're, they're an interested they're, they're interested and you know what exactly what product or type or service or whatever that they're actually interested in. There are some that they don't, I don't think the material data, data safety sheets are under a form. I think they're just an immediate download from memory because those ones you really do need to be able to get if you're building something you need to know what the uh, yeah so do you do any A-B testing yeah 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 you can do A-B testing and the bits I haven't talked about is you can build landing pages you can A-B test landing pages emails all that kind of thing so yes you can okay I've been going to be around for a while, so if you have any other questions, then just give us a shout. But thank you for your time.